Hi. In the last video, I was able to nearly complete the testing for the Control ROM control circuit and how it integrates and works with the Control ROM module itself. The only thing that's left to do is to go through each of the addresses pedantically and make sure that the value that is in the SRAM matches what it should be. And for that, I've got an ESP32 that got delivered today. Now, I've never programmed with one of these before, so I'm sure there's going to be some subtle differences between this and an Arduino, but we'll figure it out as we go along. And then time permitting, we'll get into the PCB design for both of these modules. Not sure how far we'll get today. Let's get right into it. Hi, I'm Adam. I'm still building a 16-bit computer from scratch. I'm no expert here. I make lots of mistakes. So many mistakes, I've actually had to reboot my computer build. I hope you will find my journey interesting, and I hope you will join me as I learn along the way. Okay, so here's the ESP32 that I got. It is a an ESP WROOM32. And here it is on Amazon. Again, it's not sponsored and I don't have an affiliate link or anything like this. Why did I pick this one? Because I'm cheap and it was the one of the least expensive ones I could find. I picked up the three pack so that I had more than one to play with. And here's the data sheet and of course not recommended for new designs. So that explains why I got it so cheap. I haven't played around with it much other than getting one of the sample sketches up and running for this. All right, so how is this gonna work? Well, up here, I've got the address with the gray temporary wires. This, the intent is to have that address fed from the ESP32. Now, I believe I've got some 19 or 21 pins that I can play with with this particular IC. So something's gonna have to be shifted, whether it's the address output which would be the easier thing to shift, or the data read back, which would come off of here, whoops, way off screen, which would come off here from the EEPROM itself. One of those two are gonna have to be shifted. I think I'm gonna go ahead and shift the address out because that would be the easier thing to do. Um, and then I've gotta get this on a breadboard. The form factor will fit in a breadboard, but it's better to stick it into two breadboards rather than just one and it will fit across two, two power bridges, so that's good. That'll then connect one breadboard to the other, so I've got all of this room to make other connections. So I've got a little bit to set up here so that I can get this uh, going, and then we'll wire up a couple of things, and then we'll uh, take a look and see what we can do to write a sketch for this thing. Okay, go on, you can admit it. You thought I was going to take this ESP32, which is a 3.3 volt device, and plug it into my 5 volt breadboards and blow this up. Nah, not yet. I might yet do that, but I'm not going to do it like that. So what I actually need to be able to do is I need to level shift the 3.3 volts here up to 5 volts for the rest of this circuit. The 3.3 volts with the rest of the circuit running at 5 volts isn't a high enough voltage to indicate high on this HC logic when it's running at 5 volts. When it's running at 3.3 volts, it can do that, but not at 5 volts. On the other hand, the 5 volt logic output signals coming off of the breadboards will absolutely cook this ESP, so I need to divide that down as well. I'm pretty sure I can do that here with the outputs, and I can divide those down into 3.3 volts so that they can survive and be inputs into here. And I'm pretty sure I can take the 3.3 volt outputs from the ESP32 and upconvert those to 5 volts with a simple NPN transistor. So that's what I want to try to start with here is make sure that I can get these two devices basically communicating with each other. The inputs here, well actually the inputs here, the outputs here, and the ESP32 by shifting the voltage levels. So that's the plan. Let me get a test board out and we'll see how far we can get with that. Okay, I'm gonna start by setting this aside for a minute. That way I can focus on taking a five volt and dividing that down and see if I can get 3.3 out of it. Now, I've done some calculations and double checked myself online. 
And I believe I can do this quite well with just three 1K resistors. Why 1K? Because I actually have plenty of them. All right, so now with that, if I measure the voltage here, or here, that's basically the same node, I should be at 3.3 volts when this is at five volts up here. Let's try that. So if I pick up ground up here and I measure here, that's 3.3. Now, I guess the next question is, is can this be driven from a logic high? So let's find a logic high. There's a logic high that's on pin four. So if I remove this and replace that with a jump to pin four, then I should be able to measure this again. Yeah. And so that's the problem is it's not giving me what I want up here. So this is probably 1.14. The other thing to try then would be using a transistor here to see if I can't properly shift that to 3.3 volts. Okay, so I can manufacture 3.3 volts by connecting five volts here, and then I should be able to take, let me get orange, 3.3 off of here and connect it to here so that I've got a good strong 3.3 volts. Okay, let me get a data sheet for the transistor. I'm set up down here now, collector, base, emitter. So the base then would be connected to there. My collector should be there at 3.3 volts. Now, for the record here, I've got four volts coming in, 3.3 and change going out. That is effectively level shifting, so I'm going to go with that. I think that's going to be a good thing. Now, with that same methodology, I expect that I should be able to level shift back up to 5 volts. So, if I take 5 volts from here, and I just jump my base across, I'll just daisy chain them. Then if that's the case... 3.6 input, my output should be 5. It's not 5. Why is it not 5? I did some digging online, and one of the things I came across was an article on using a transistor as an inverter in order to bring 3.3 volts up to 5 volts. Once again, I've got here just over 3.3 volts coming in. So let's turn this into an inverter. And for that, I need a 10K resistor up here on top. I say on top, that's going to be for the collector. And then I take the emitter and connect it to ground. And then this now would be zero volts. If I take and turn that gate off, I'm at 5 volts. So off produces 5 volts and on produces 0 volts. So let's invert that again. When I measure the inverter, second inverter, I now have nearly 5 volts. And again, if I bring this to ground, that's 0. So my dual inverter arrangement here will actually be able to shape my 5 volt signals. One thing to keep in mind is I don't believe I actually need the second inverter. I can take care of that particular inversion in software. Okay, with that as the plan, let me get the sketch written for the ESP32. I think I've got something that's going to work here. I used an external utility to dump the contents of Control ROM 0, and that is here. I was able to pipe that onto a source file which has been included in the project here and you can see 001313 that's the value first three values that I have been looking for as I've been going through my testing all right so I contain a uh, external declaration for that my inputs are bits 0 through 7 and you'll notice that the pins 
are not congruent. These are the GPIO pins, not the actual physical pins on the dev board. Why are they not sequential? I have no idea. You'd have to ask this espresso. I also have the reset hold line. Now recall this is an open drain. Here in the code, I'm going to be pulling this particular line high if nothing else is directly pulling it low. So I have a pull up resistor internal to the ESP32 that I am then pulling this line high to. My outputs are a clock for latching, a clock for shifting. They will not be congruent or using the same timing. The address out pin and a clear out pin. And then I'm also using the built-in LED. My setup sets up the pin modes and here is that pull up. And then for my outputs, I also set those up and then I set up my LED as well. Now recall for my outputs, I'm going to be using only one inverter on the breadboard. So I need to invert the signals once in hardware and once in software. Now in the loop, the first thing I do is I wait for a reset to complete, meaning I wait for that reset hold signal to not driven low anymore and let the pull up resistor actually take that signal high. And so as long as it's low, I am still in reset and I am waiting for that. So until that goes high, I wait a half a second. Then I turn on the LED and I write to the serial port that I'm testing. And then for each of the 32K, I perform some checks here. So I check the byte to make sure that it matches. And all it does is it reads the SRAM and compares to that table that I showed you earlier. And then I've got some output here just to keep track of where we're at in the process. I don't output every address, but just kind of keep you informed of what's going on. Now, if for some reason that check byte does not pass, then obviously I report that it failed. And then I go into an infinite loop flashing the blue LED and doing absolutely nothing else. It requires a hard reset to get out of that. Otherwise, if we get to this point, we're good. And I turn off the LED and report that the SRAM is congruent with what it's expected to be. And then I wait for the reset holds to go high again, meaning that I could in fact reset the control ROM circuit and have it execute that test multiple times. All right, so this is gonna get interesting then with the wire up because I've only written software and that's it. So let's get the breadboards out. Well, let's take a look here and talk a little bit about what I've got going on. Uh, this is the obviously the ESP32. Here's the breadboard where I'm going to build the level shifting circuits and the shift registers here for shifting the address out to these locations here where I've got them tied to ground. So I'll end up replacing each of these lines with something coming from here. This is just my reference PCB. It has the level shift from 5 volts to 3.3 volts. And then half of this will end up being, so it's over here on this side, will end up being the level shift from 3.3 volts up to 5 volts. Now that in, is done with an inverter. And so remember, software here on the ESP32 will do the other half of that inversion to get back to the natural signal. I have the 5 volt rail plugged in up here. That's up here to this circuit here. And then I have the 3.3 volt coming off of the ESP32. I've got it jumped down here. And this bottom will be the 3.3 volt rail. Grounds are tied together. Ground is tied back to this circuit. Everything has to share common ground. Now the first thing I want to do is I want to take the outputs off the ESP32 that I have to find. I want to tie them up to wherever they're going to go would be that the clear, be that the clock, what have you, and do the level shifting here associated with those. And I'm going to do all of this with temporary hookup wires because none of this circuit is going to actually persist past this test. I want to get my reference circuit tidied up here a little bit. So I'm going to remove this extra bit here and then my voltage divider. And then this is my input 
So I will let that dangle over here. So this now gives me a reference that I can now use in order to build the level shift here on the outputs of the ESP32. Now I'm going to start with the outputs because if I get with these HC logic, if I end up with 3.3 volts going into it, they'll still survive. It gives me a little bit of practice of thinking my way through this, this concern. So I need to level shift 3.3 to 5 volts. So I'm going to use the inverter signal here. And there are four that I need to worry about. One is clear. One is a shift. One is a clock. One is an address. Let's start with the clear signal because that's going to be used very infrequently. And now I've got my pin diagram here, which indicates where the GPIO pins are in the purple there so i'm going to use that as reference i'll stick it up on the screen there's going to be a lot of references that i need to keep straight here and so for the clear i'm using gpio 21 that's going to be okay i'm already off to the wrong start here hang on a second this is the one i want to use there's the gpios here and gpio 21 is going to be Five pins down, one, two, five pins down. Okay, 21. And I'll drop that right here for now. I need five volts associated with that. So yeah, I'll do it down here. I'll drag it across. Okay, source gate drain. And then I need a 10,000 ohm resistor. Bring that up to five volts. The output of that now, let's flip this around. Pin nine. Okay, that is supposed to handle my clear signal. Now my shift signal is on pin one. Next up is my shift in address. That's gonna be on GPIO three. Final one is the latch clock. Now the latch clock is going to be up here and this clock is now going to drive the oscillator. So I need to be very cautious about hooking that up. But I'm now in a position to steal this stuff because I've got reference over here now. Okay, that's my outputs off the ESP32. I don't have my signals from here wired up to this location yet and i don't have enough long jumpers to do that so i'm gonna to have to find a ribbon cable cable or two in order to make those connections okay i'm pulling stuff off the build so i may end up regretting this but in the meantime we'll use it here so these can come out because those are all tied to specific addresses and I will wire these down to that spot. These can come out as well. And recall that the most significant bit up here is already wired to ground here, so I need no connection over here. Okay, the next step is going to take the outputs off of the latch up here and just bring them down so that I can level shift those to 3.3 volts. So I'm just going to stick them right in the middle here for now. Now, this should be relatively trivial because I've got my gate signal, which comes out here. I've got my drain, which connects to 3.3 volts, and then the output of which is going to go to the ESP32. So let's take a look at that. That is the most significant bit that's going to go to pin 26, GPIO pin 26. And that will be from here. So now all I have to do is get the transistor in there. Seven more like that. I think before I go about hooking all of these up to the ESP32, I think I want to get these inserted in here, but I want to test voltages just to make sure that things are not going to go bang. I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup here. 
and we'll come back and give this a shot. So off camera, I tested continuity between all of these signals up here. Uh, I used down here because they're on the same node as this and easier to get to. It made sure that the base and emitter were not cross connected. I had used the wrong terminology before. It is the base and the emitter that is I'm worried about. Now let's go ahead and apply power here and I need power from two locations. I need power for the five volts here which brings up most of the rest. Why is that on? Okay I think I was back bleeding power back through the ESP32 which is not good. So I powered up the ESP32 on the USB. If I now power off the five volt circuit the 5 volt goes dead, the ESP32 stays powered. So that may be a, an important power on sequence I've got to pay attention to. According to this, all of these are on. So let me see, that glare is going to be bad. Let me see what my voltage is here. 4.8 volts there. I should have, where's a good ground? 4.7 volts there, but now if I look at the emitter here, here, to ground, 4 volts. Actually, that's going to be a problem. That would have really made a mess of this ESP. So now what is my issue here? Why is this doing what it shouldn't be doing? Okay, so I did quite a bit of troubleshooting and some thinking on camera. And ultimately, I ended up back to the place that I started, which was simply dividing the signal from a 5-volt signal to a 3.3-volt signal using a voltage divider. But if I just divided that, that's 3.3. But the problem I had was that when I went to here... I'll just pick one as an example. I believe my voltage goes belly up here. No. So can I just divide that? I can just build a voltage divider all the way across here, is what I'm seeing. And not even have to worry about this 3.3 rail. Hmm, interesting. Well, let's give that a shot. Before I get into the rest of this, I think it's important to answer why... I had trouble in the beginning with a 4 volt that was coming off the D-type latch and not dividing down properly and able to provide an input. I believe, and check the comments because I'm sure someone's going to straighten me out if I'm wrong, but I believe that the D-type latch, the 74HC74, is not built to drive a line of significant distance. On the other hand, the 74HCT574, which is the octal D-type latch that has tri-state output, is actually configured to drive a line of significant length. Now I say significant, I'm thinking a meter versus a couple of inches. So what does that then mean? It means that the way I have this hooked up now to the output of the octal D-type latch with tri-state output, I'm actually able to drive more current across the line, which then allows me to actually divide that using a voltage divider, whereas the 74HC74 single D-type, or actually dual D-type in that package, does not have the same tri-state output and therefore cannot drive that same amount of current. And then from here, I should be able to test this and get 3.3 volts. Let's see how well that works. All right, this should be 5 volts. Okay, well, that looks like it's going to work. And now I'm looking at my clock here. So if I actually perform a reset here, it is ticking, but this is not indicated. That's because it's locked up. So let's reset that. 
That's ticking away. All right, I guess I need my serial output. Let's grab that. So I'm holding the reset on the circuit, and now I'm going to reset the ESP32. So it's waiting. If I release that now, it's still waiting for reset hold. Interestingly enough, it actually worked. So what was my confusion? Let's start down here with the LED, because I believe it's related to the LED. So reading for reset hold, it stays low, then, and it remains low while it's in reset. And it's in reset while it's copying. So that's where my confusion was. Once it stopped, then it went straight into testing. My location zero failed. So what is on my SRAM for an address? So up here, I'm expecting the address of the SRAM to be zero. Let's see, where's the easiest place to test that? Let's get the logic probe. Let's use the right device. All right, let me do the reset again. I reset, reset, release, and put it into run mode. So those are the bits that are latched. Right off the bat, I've got high here, high, high. So did I not invert this properly? Time to get back into the sketch. Okay, well, the problem I thought I had was here, but I did find a problem here where I was feeding in the inverted address to read the byte off of the array that's included in the data. Well, that was incorrect. So I did fix this to pass in the actual address, which is fine. But now this means that I got to go check what's being shifted and make sure that it's actually shifting the correct stuff. Let's start with maybe making sure that what I'm shifting out is correct. So, all right, let's give this a try. Okay, found a couple of errors up here in trying to debug. Now, I expected to read 00, zero. I did read FF. So now my question is, is my address correct or is my output correct? And so here's what I see. I see FF up here. So what is my address that is on the circuit? So the address is correct. I actually have my inverter wired wrong. Now let's get that cleaned up. All right, let's try that again. I'll hold and reset. I'll reset here, release that, release that. All right, I gotta redo that because something still didn't come back right. All right, I got garbage. Okay, so before I get too far ahead of myself here, I am running into some trouble. And one of the things I had to do because I was running into some hardware trouble is I ended up putting these 1K resistors in here in order to make sure that I wasn't pulling too much current through the base to the emitter. Now, I also grabbed a second ESP32 just to see if it wasn't the ESP32 that was a problem. I get the same behavior on both, so I'm at this point ruling that out. I did end up moving a pin from what looks like a receive pin over to a different pin. It's entirely possible that I might have picked incorrect pins here. It did improve, well, it improved the voltages. It didn't improve the behavior. There's another pin that's intended to be transmit. I think I'm going to try moving that as well to the next one down. So that's then going to go to GPIO 18. So that's the clear pin, which is entirely possible that that is a problem. I didn't even consider that. I'm going to continue debugging. This is going to be a little bit more difficult because I'm dealing with software, hardware, and hardware at different voltage levels. So my intent is to put in some pauses so that I can measure things at certain things throughout the code. I'll let you know what I find out. Okay, I said I'd bring you back when I had something, and I have something. Okay, so forgive me for doing all of this debugging off camera. 
I have my stupid cheap oscilloscope out, but it actually was helpful. So let me turn it right side up and we'll talk a little bit about first the code. I tried several different things, but what I have right now is after each pulse of the clock, I have the code stopped waiting for input so that I can control the reads one at a time. I also down here took out the fail point, so I'm just checking every single byte regardless of whether or not it fails. So what did I find? I'm going to need several hands here because I need my keyboard as well. And so let me reset. This has already been programmed, so let me reset the ESP32. As I go through this and I hit the enter key each time, notice the rising edge, but I've also got it at 50 microseconds per division. I'm going to go to 50 nanoseconds per division. Look at how flat that line is. 250 nanoseconds per division, 500 nanoseconds per division. It is spending a lot of time, relatively speaking, and you can see a capacitance curve. It's spending a lot of time, relatively speaking, in this no man's land. And that is causing issues, as you can watch here, when I get down to the least significant bit, I get five bits instead of one because of the amount of time it's spending in no man's land. So that is here, and I have a 10,000 ohm resistor in there. So let me switch this for a 1,000 ohm resistor. Okay, and I will reset. Now look at how sharp that transition is. And when I get down to the least significant bit, one bit, then it disappears. And I'm actually getting, if I look at my screen again, I'm actually getting a good read finally. So that really boils down to the signal was not being driven fast enough. And that ended up being the root of the problem. I'm going to reset the code. And then I'm going to run that through and we'll see how that turns out okay i'm almost ready to continue on i have three more 10k ohm resistors that i really want to replace with 1000 ohm resistors so let me get that done real quick all right let's turn on the esp32 and we'll send the code in the meantime, I'll get that running and reset because this can run through while the ESP32 is actually loading. And you can see it's reading the different addresses here, which is good. And you can see on the screen it's going through all of them. Now, this is going to take a while, so I don't anticipate that you'll have to sit here and watch the entire thing. I'll pause it here and pick up at the end of this. Okay, it's getting close. All right, that shows good. I'm pleased with that. The only challenge is it took an hour to run. So what I think I might do is try this again, but remove all the delays in each of the steps here. For example, I've got three milliseconds, one millisecond, one millisecond, one millisecond. So there's a lot of delays that are built into this. I think I'm going to pull a number of these out, a good number of these out and see if I can't get some really good improvement here and how long it takes to actually process all of this. At the same time, I'm going to pull the EEPROM out and poke a value into the last byte so that I'm reading something other than zero just to make sure that I actually get a good read. And so if I jump here, the last byte, let's make it AA. And I will make that same change on the EE prom. I'll come back and we'll kick, up, kick off testing. Okay, you can see the dump here. I do have AA as the last byte, which matches AA as the last byte. All right, let's program this thing. Okay. So it looks like those, some of those, at least some of those delays are required. So what do we need? I started off thinking that the delays that I had removed had actually caused a problem where it wasn't actually reading the SRAM properly. I had a couple of those back in with no change in behavior. 
And ultimately what I did is I pulled the address lines off to the side so that I could hardwire them and investigate what was in SRAM for address zero. Now it turns out that what's in address zero exactly matches the AA that should be in the high order byte of the SRAM as well. Now I checked that and made sure that it got programmed and it did. I didn't check anything in the middle. But what that tells me is I have a problem with the last byte being written that it's overlaying the first byte as well. So I've got a bit of a timing problem with the control ROM control logic still that I've got to get to the bottom of. At the same time, I did also realize that several of the signals between the SRAM and the line driver were twisted about. And I'm not exactly certain how the circuit is working in the state that it's in. So I need to do a little bit more digging on that and get that wrapped up on breadboard before I can actually call this complete. So the next step here is going to be to break out the emulator and duplicate this test on the emulator and see what it does with this test scenario. All right, I know. I'm leaving you on a cliffhanger and I'm sorry for that. But I made a promise several videos ago when I had a couple of back-to-back -back videos that were close to an hour that I wouldn't do that to you again. It's hard on me making those videos that long. It's hard for you, I know, to find the time to commit to those videos. And so I'm going to leave this here. We'll come back to the emulator and then schematic and then some more breadboard testing in the next video. What's important to note is that if the first byte and the last byte were exactly the same in the EEPROM, they would copy over to the SRAM properly. If I was to, say for example, make the 00, zero instruction no op and then the FF, well, really it's 000, zero, zero and FFF. If I was to make those two instructions no ops and use the FFF for specifically jump delays and the like in order to give the flags a chance to settle before I actually evaluated them, then that would be a good use of that. And I may come back around to that. But I'm more interested in making sure that this works correctly. And so since I have about what I estimate, probably 20 more minutes of video here, it's just going to make this one too long. So once again, I apologize for the cliffhanger, but we'll get into the emulator and see if I can't duplicate this problem there. We'll see you soon.